I'm an art historian by training, and so my my historian radar is just constantly on for anniversaries of things. Uh, so I curated the uh, Space War exhibition that barely opened within the 50th year of its existence, wow. um, as one example of that. But anyway, uh, this year, I guess, toward the end of last year, I was looking at uh, Janet's book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, and I was like, when, when, when did this thing come out? And I looked, I was like, oh, oh my God, almost 20 years ago, we got to do something about this. <laughs> so, so here we are doing it. Um, Twitter existence of all of us. You may notice there's a fourth empty <laughs> stool really far away from us right now. Um, it's not because we're doing anything dramatic with Ian, it's rather that he's on an airplane and may or may not arrive in time. However, we may, there are a few people in here who we feel like can channel Ian pretty well that may be called upon to come up and join us at, at moments. If anyone gets the urge, they should just grab yeah, that position. Yeah, if there's somebody that's feeling Bogostian, <laughs> then <laughs> by all means, please join us. Um, so I think the way we're gonna do intros is I would like Janet to talk a little bit about her book and oh. what was going on at that time. Oh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you. And, and um, I take 50% uh, responsibility for game studies, I guess. <laughs> uh, it was not my intention. Um, and I guess I should say that I, the, I've just done a revised version that it was out in uh, in a very hard to find Simon and Schuster um, ebook, but it's coming out from MIT Press shortly, so that will be easier to find hopefully. Uh, and um, uh, I I uh, and the uh, I guess my take on looking back 20 years is I was right. <laughs> so, I feel that's all. We could just end it there. Okay. Could you summarize uh, why you were right? Well, yes. Because, so, and I think it's because I was privileged to um, be at MIT for the 20 years before I wrote it and to have um, a, uh, a field of vision in which 20 years is sort of a moment because I, my training was in history of the novel. So I had looked at a hundred multiple century year uh, development of art forms. And so what, and I had had this insight in the early 1980s. Um, so well before most of you were born uh, that uh, when I saw Eliza, did, did, how many people know what Eliza? Oh, good. See, it's very well educated. This is just really great. Uh, and uh, Zork, which I hope everybody knows what that is. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, it's Robinson Crusoe. Oh, this is a story and it works, but it's just the beginning of a genre. Uh, and so I immediately fell in love with it as a medium and I switched my <laughs> career uh, and mostly because I was at MIT, I didn't have to actually code anything. Uh, I had learned programming, but I, um, I, um, I knew that I wasn't going to have to do it. I, I had studied it before uh, graduate school. So uh, that's what went into it was that literary sensibility plus the sense that this was a medium. And then I had been making stuff at MIT for 20 years, uh, mostly at what we then called humanities computing, um, which is now called digital humanities, uh, and mostly uh, stories of different kinds. Um, so uh, um, I guess, uh, so, but what, what I wanted to say in that book was, here is a new medium for storytelling, but um, it, it coincided with people who were uh, very self-consciously starting game studies 
Uh, I always said that I, the entire nation of Finland attacked me for this book. <laughs> so only uh, the postal workers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but then they went postal. Yeah. <laughs> so um, and so it was one of the first books that took games seriously and did um, did readings of games, and therefore it. it um, and I would say that interactive narrative, which I've continued to focus on in my career, uh, now uh, since uh, 99 have been at Georgia Tech, uh, is still catching up to that. But now people take it for granted that games uh, can be thought of as um, a form of storytelling as well as, uh, as uh, other things. And then, of course, there's a, another book up here on the screen, Espen Arsith, who uh, unfortunately wasn't able to get over here to join us. I believe he was part of that band of rogue Finlandians. He was the major enabler. Even However, he's not one Finnish. thing that's good about living long is that he, you get to see people recant. So, <laughs> so it's so satisfying. <laughs> so, uh, so Espen actually now, uh, after accusing me of being a narratologist, and believe me, I can never remember which is the sujet and which is the whatever the other thing is, uh, that uh, uh, he wrote, he uh, uh, switched his career to talking about the narratology in games. Uh, but I think they were caught up in a political thing where they wanted to. Uh, and they were right to assert that games were separate from narrative. They were just wrong to attack me about it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. Um, and then, I've cho of the, the many things Mary has done, I chose one of her books to put up here, next to one of Ian's many books up here. To, uh, what I, in my mind is kind of that the second wave of folks coming into the field. Yes. Mary, I don't know if you want to talk a little yes, bit about... I knew her when. That was one of the first blessings of writing that book was we, I was at, uh, in the mountains somewhere where people ski, and you showed your... That's brilliant. They, it, was, uh, they, uh, it was like a prefigured VR. It was a 3D uh, exploration of a fire that you... It was a memoir yeah. of a fire. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. And he's just showing at Carnegie Mellon, actually, right now. Yeah. But that was 98, too. But you were at the beginning of your career. was, dear. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so maybe it's less a second wave than, or just a very quickly following wave. Uh, it's the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, did you get started from the practitioner side or the scholarly side? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I did a degree in film studies and feminist film studies in particular, and then I worked with this guy in the front row uh, <laughs> who turned me into a designer. Um, so that's how I, after graduate school, I moved to Texas and became a software developer. Yeah. And from the beginning, games were part of yeah. the kind of the lexicon yeah. of. But we were we talked about them as multimedia. We talked about them as new media. We talked about them as interactives. I mean, no one really had uh, yeah. language that was. Did you, you did you say they were games or did you? Well, we it, used to say they were exercises. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a there was a strange kind of higher there was a you know. Uh, a, a strange hierarchy at that point where games were kind of taboo yeah. in terms of taking being taken seriously, yeah. being getting funding, you know, different different groups kind of owned what a game was and so if you wanted to do learning games, some some groups preferred you to say learning multimedia. I, I it was just there's lots of l little bit of language wars going on and now I think it's totally done. No one has to deal with that anymore. I mean, that around that same time was the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the heyday of Voyager. Yes. Right. Yep. Oh, that are, was a little earlier. Are folks familiar with uh, Voyager CD-ROMs back in the 90s? Yeah. I mean, those. I'm trying to remember what labels were put on the back of those boxes. If they were called games or just multimedia. Oh, they were not called games. They were not. No. I mean, some were not games. They were they encyclopedias. Were, they were, they were. But like the uh, Puppet Motel and the things oh, the exactly. residents were doing, those, I think, today, freak nobody, show. Freak Show, Nobody would have any qualms about calling those 
games. I think Myst, which came out around the same time, yeah. was the turning point. Right, so 93, I think. Something yeah. like that. Um, so I asked these folks to provide a pithy definition of game studies for us today. So, Janet, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit. Yeah, I want to see what I said and if I still agree with this since <laughs> last week. You, you reserve the right to have changed your mind <laughs> in the studies. last 72 hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, so game studies, I think, in, is one thing that's exciting about it is that it links back to the history of games uh, and that it includes the exploration of games in other forms, like uh, Mary makes a lot of board games as well as a digital game. People make installations. So I think that all of those, what? Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> the people in the far back. I, I see Colleen Macklin's head back there. We've oh, there she is. How wonderful. And Naomi. So I would say that uh, the game studies uh, is that intersection of the human activity of games, which I think is one of the oldest of human activities, uh, and um, uh, with the new opportunity of a medium in which you can procedurally represent the game system and, and participate in it. Mary gave me a much longer definition and said that I could feel free to try to trim it, so I just took the first sentence, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps you remember the, the longer parts. Do you want to talk a little bit about? Huh. That's pretty. That's a. That's the generic part. That's yes, the intro. Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> the intro. Sorry. <laughs> this is the hand waving definition. Um, games. Um, so I, I guess one of the things that that interests me about the development of game studies is I, I did my first uh, undergraduate degree in film studies, and I see real similarities between the ways in which, you know, film as a medium uh, struggled to be recognized intellectually um, beyond, you know, its popular culture aspect to become studied and everything else. And so I think that when we trace game studies, uh, a very similar thing has happened, although, you know, different arguments, different debates, different language, and different themes have emerged. But um, one of the things that's interesting about film studies is they, they really go back to the mechanical origins um, like, you know, the uh, phenakistoscope and, you know, name your cool device that is Moy Bridge, you know, like name, basically those are the big things to do, you know, kinograph yeah. and anyway. Um, so, so they kind of go back to a mechanical reproduction of, of time-based motion. Um, in games, there was a move for a while, I mean, there's the platform studies idea, which is a similar kind of unrooting, oh, like games go back to, they're defined or influenced he heavily by their platforms. But my, my definition wants to go, if you know critical play, further back to just say, as Janet suggested, we have, we have 8,000 years of documented board games. I just found a, a, a Tang Dynasty rule book. Wow. <laughs> you know, wow! Anyway, I'm doing research right now. It's really cool. Um, so this idea that we can, we can kind of trace what games are, and I think a, a big... A very important thing to come out of this panel that we should never let Janet out of the room um, <laughs> when she's in a room with you is that is this notion that we all take for granted if we play games, which is the notion of player agency, and that almost any time you talk about player agency, really you're the person who said, "Wow, that's what makes a game really special." That there are there are rules that 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 set up something in which we can make decisions and have agency. And that, that yeah. is a very specific part of your, um, your bringing to the field that, that, that precise difference. Um, so I think that starting from those kinds of differences, we end up um, tracing why games are a different art form. Kind of like, and, and I like to think of you know, narrative over here and sound and you know, stories and games as their own kind of Place. They're not a medium. They're not. They're. 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 They're, they're an er art form. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. We'll just all imagine for a moment what Ian's definition would be. Did you delete his definition because he's not here, or did you? Or did he? Did he not give you one? I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, uh, I don't know, look at that. We'll just leave Ian's quote or uh, definition up on the screen for a few minutes. Um, what is, you're just touching on this, you, so you kind of answered it, Mary, but the object of study, right? What, what is it exactly? It's players, it's player agency, it's the, the, the material form, whatever it might be, software, dice, board games, basketballs, whatever. Um, can, we, can we get to a, a single object of study? Or can we even get down to a smaller toolkit of objects to, of study? Well, so the toolkit is what you would apply to the object, mm -hmm. I guess. So um, uh, the, I think that I, I like, if you go back to Mary's <laughs> definition, though Ian's is very eloquent, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's that it's I think that what's very striking, was striking from the first uh, digital games conferences, is that people are coming from very disparate disciplines, mm -hmm. and that they, they do seem to have in common that they're studying something that is uh, not work <laughs> and that is structured in some way. And, but the way, the methodologies in which they study it are very, very different. And, and I, I'm grateful for your, uh, you know, uh, uh, crediting me with the, uh, with the, uh, I would say what I did was a proselytize for the importance of agency as an aesthetic principle. And that came out of build, coming from design teams that also had been trained in all these different disciplines. Uh, and that how do you know when you make a good one? And how do you argue with somebody who's trained in art and design who thinks that minimalism should rule? Uh, or somebody who thinks that this character, it's about character. And I think that um, when I uh, challenge myself to say, well, if this is a new, uh, a new practice, if this is a new medium, the digital, for story, and I was thinking storytelling, then, um, then what is it unique about it? Well, what's unique about it is that it is participatory and procedural, that, you, that it will respond to you it, by rules in some way, and that that has to be shapely, or it doesn't make a difference how much visual authority it has. Um, but there's nothing like that for game studies. So I would, I will, I will, you know, um, uh, defend that principle uh, to uh, against any other aesthetic. Uh, I, it doesn't mean that someone couldn't purposely make a game in which you frustrate agency, but then you're still playing with agency. But there's nothing that you could say about game studies, which is, I think, appropriately plural, that says, okay, it has to be this, or it isn't game studies. Uh, because people will give very computational papers in game studies. Mm -hmm. They'll give very uh, sociological papers in game studies. And uh, at the beginning, that made a lot of tension and hostility. I think now people accept that difference. Uh, to me, it's valuable only if it tells you how to make a better one. <laughs> so I think that game studies is only valuable to the extent that it is convening a, uh, a uh, structured discourse that gives people, doesn't have to be one uh, aesthetic, although mine are the right ones, <laughs> but, uh, but that gives people a set of critical terms with which to clarify the objects of their own creativity. So if there were nobody making games, then I wouldn't, then the, the game studies could just, you know, go away as far as I'm concerned. It's about, it's making is what justifies all of that talking. Mm -hmm. 
the historian in me winces slightly at that. And but the makers go, yes. Yeah, but, um, well. What, yeah, what first Digra was 2001 or three? Um, yeah, I don't know. I have to Somewhere. look at my, my CV. Yeah. So anyone remember? It was after I was... 2003? 2003. Thank okay. You. Oh, DAC, Digital Arts and Culture, was 2000. Not oh, right. One. It was 99. Right, right, it started right. in 99. Right, and that's when I think... I wasn't there, but that's when the ludologist attacked me. <laughs> in your absence, how cowardly yes. of them. Yes, yes. Right. Mary, do you have anything to add on the object of study question? I think this notion of, of methodologies is an interesting one. Um, you know, you're coming from things from an art historical perspective. Um, right now I'm working a lot with psychology, social psychology in my research lab. Um, you know, a, hum a humanities approach is, is also really filled with sub-methodologies, right? Like I'm gonna do a Marxist reading of, uh, you know, World of Warcraft like Scott Retberg did in um, the edited collection about it you know so 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 there are these there are these moments where um, we, we, wear, we wear these different lenses and I think it's interesting though that that your your notion is as long as it makes a better game right I'm, I'm also interested in what it what what games do um, in culture mm -hmm. and and how that you know makes a better culture well but you're defining I mean what is better I know and this Th is that's this an is aesthetic. we're gonna get that's attacked good. by Finnish people yeah well <laughs> I think I think they've been looking pacified. around to see if there are any in the room um, yeah. yeah I mean I think that I've always felt like there isn't really a game studies they're just these events that all of these multiplicity of tribes descend upon yeah um, I mean a lot of the kind of foundation the ur texts that get called on often tend to come from sociologists quite often. Like uh, there's like Goffman, who I feel like is underrated for like fun and games and the stuff and encounters. Um, yeah. But there's a, that, a lot of anthropologists, sociologists. Philosophers. Philosophers. Um, and to some degree, literary studies folks, right? Yeah. Like there's a whole volume in Ehrman did. There was like a Feschriffen for this... Uh, French studies fellow named Jacques Ehrman, I think his name was, in like 1960 something or another, but there's all huh. of these amazing papers about, mostly about kind of wordplay inside of literature and the appearance of games in literature and film and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of people kind of poking around, but there wasn't really a sustained effort, except I, you know, one of the oh. things that's always confused me is the gap between game studies and then the um, kind of folk scholars who very much there's a whole other universe of scholars and practitioners who are concerned with toys and play and very seldom do we seem to interact with them, which seems somewhat unfortunate to me, but well, maybe that's what we'll do in the next 20. But, but I mean, Brian Sutton Smith would yeah. be another one of those founding yeah. people. Um, he's coming up. And he's got a new book coming out, yes. He's coming up. Posted. Yes. Oh, he is? Right there. Yeah. Oh. So I asked, I also asked these folks to um, pick a handful of what they feel are important works within the field of game studies to talk to us about briefly. So, Mary? We're only allowed to pick two. But... Everybody. That's pick not a more. handful. No, <laughs> that's a pair. Um, so quibbling so, over details. So so that was really difficult actually, and I I it, it, I I kept wanting to change, um, but then I wasn't allowed to. But uh, but I but it, I, so I can talk about all the other things that I wanted to think about. But I wanted to first point out that Celia Pierce's interactive book that came out, I also believe, twenty years yeah. ago, um, yeah. uh, was was for me. Um, a uh, really pivotal moment. Uh, it came out in, I think it was 96. I was uh, still working as a software developer with, with um, Lloyd in Texas. This book comes out, suddenly I'm kind of choose your own adventure history theorying. <laughs> and um, it's a really big fat book that had a lot of uh, stuff about uh, interaction design, theme park design, pop culture, and it touched on games, it touched on gender in games. Uh, and, and they're always like, you know, turn to page this. So it, it was this really kind of fun, um, literally interactive book. Uh, this is before I met Celia. Um, so uh, when I met her, I was like, you're Celia Pierce. <laughs> now she is my friend. Um, but I think it's interesting that she had, um, that she saw that, the, that studying interactive design and interactive 
things like games required a different kind of text or suggested a different kind of way of writing about them, which I think is, is really telling. Was she already working on um, theme parks and that sort of yeah. thing back then? Yeah. 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 yeah, it's one of the, COE is an amazingly fascinating person who has <laughs> all kinds of things and interesting details, things she's worked on in her past. Right. And then I chose uh, Brian Sutton Smith's ambiguity of play because he, he's really, um, he really brings about this this notion that almost like like trying trying to define play itself has a number of different dimensions and a number of different ways one can like look through different lenses to see play and they're they're sometimes counterintuitive or uh, exclusive for example you can look at um, you can look at play through the rhetoric of identity. Like we play together, therefore this is the kind of people we are. We play this game. You know, um, uh, you could look at the way in which um, uh, the, the the rhetoric of conflict. We've won. Our community is better than yours uh, in sports, for example, or our country won the Olympics. Ha <laughs> ha. So that that kind of one-upsmanship. And then you have play as ritual, play as um, uh, community building. So so he he kind of takes takes the reader in a really accessible way through these ideas, um, not necessarily looking at digital games. I mean, he's studied all kinds of, of, uh, of historical uh, and community-based play around the world. So he has a global perspective, which I really appreciate as well. It, uh, it, it kind of gets us off of technology and off of thinking about um, what we do a little bit broader in terms of culture. I also gave you this one, since we were talking about it in in the, in the email you form, can talk about I it can too. talk about it too. Yeah, so a um, a rumor I've always heard is that Jesper was the first actual game studies PhD. Yes. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Second. He was at the first. Oh yeah. And then some woman. Oh, a uh, Brenda Laurel. Brenda. Yeah. Oh, Brenda right, because yeah. she wrote the first dissertation. Which will be showing up momentarily. Okay. No, we're getting a, our Sorry, fact pizza, checker over here is but saying no to us. She became, a, it was like some woman and she later became a masseuse. No. That is not who no, we're thinking not about. That's not Brenda, but it's someone else. I think you're uh, speaking alternative facts, Tony. I don't know. <laughs> Whoa, well, I have, I... <laughs> I'll ask I'm, you, we'll ask Jesper. So Jesper was the first one to come out of that Nordic group. Right. Right. Where they separated off. We don't have to Arapologist. fetishize the firsts. No. We could just say early. Yes. But he was, I always thought he was the suit. You know, like, <laughs> 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 like he made it. Like clubs? Dull or something. Oh, <laughs> Not, or, or organized. He made yeah, it, we'll call he it made organized. It, he made it, <laughs> yeah, he, he made it. Oh. Structured. Yeah. He brought. He started to bring order, right? I feel. I always feel like um, a lot of the. He made into an academic discourse. A lot of the w defined games, um, sort of trope. I feel like kind of starts with him, or at least he's always in my mind yeah. a big part of that yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And he did a very thorough. He, actually, not this book, but his thesis did a very thorough, uh, uh, just a taxonomy of of definitions of games, yeah. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> so Janet, oh. tell us about yours. So yeah, so I, you know, so I had a lot of alternates too. I don't know, did you put? Yeah, there's a second. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, but, um, but another one that I didn't send you would have been uh, Celia's um, community of play because I think that um, communities of play, just the way in which he took that anthropological approach uh, to online gaming uh, and described the people who were thrown out of the mist-themed uh, virtual world as acting like emigres, uh, immigrants into these other worlds. I thought that, and then said, well, how, would, and she passes my test, of how will it make a better one? So she said, well, what was it about these other worlds that let them express this affiliation? Uh, um, so how do you build worlds that allow for that kind of creativity? Um, 
So, but the two that I picked were the most recent. I, you know, I thought I'd pick things that were at the end of this 20 years, which have gone by rather fast for me. And uh, I was just found out that Natasha is here at NYU. I didn't realize that. Uh, Natasha Show. So this book, Addiction by Design, is uh, just a brilliant uh, description of how uh, gambling machines are made. And it's a wonderful corrective to the kind of sentimental celebration of flow. Because she talks about how those machines are made to put people in the zone. And this was really an important insight for me, and it goes back to the ludologists, actually, is that it, I realized, and also to Gamergate, in that I thought, well, one of the things that people like about games is its escapism, and that the thing, uh, she, she talks about this moment at which gamblers and slot machines, she talks about slot machines, are, uh, they don't, they're annoyed by winning because it interrupts the flow <laughs> of engagement with the machine. And the machine is made to just max out their credit card until they die, you know. <laughs> so it's really, it's, 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 it, it, it's uh, sinister. And, uh, but it's, uh, and so it really makes you question the moral uh, values of, of game design. But, um, but that idea that there's a zone that people want to be in, and that it enrages them to bring in reminders of the emotive world. Uh, and uh, that I thought that this is what, why there was so much pushback for something that we now all take for granted, that games can be symbolic of an emotional state. Uh, and that we use the games as a metaphor for an emotional state all the time. But people thought that that was some kind of a disgrace that I said, well, you know, Tetris can be seen uh, when people are playing it, this how they describe it. They said, no, 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 use the sacrilege to Tetris. It has to be this pure experience. Well, why does it have to be this pure experience? Because there's a zone in which it's really, you, it, the point of the zone is not to confront whatever it is disturb that's disturbing you. So I thought that that's a, just a, it's a good marker. And then uh, I've, just, uh, have been, I've just been reading uh, Catherine Ispitz's book, and I thought to myself, well, this is really doing what I was doing 20 years ago, is that she's going through, and she's doing close readings of games, but it's so interesting to me that she's doing it from this social science rhetoric. <laughs> so she thinks of emotions as affects. Uh, which, um, you know, ordinarily I wouldn't read a book for a person who called an emotion an affect. And I think that the person who she uh, trained with 20 years ago was really uh, very um, uh, uh, dense about human emotion. I mean, he's the guy who was responsible for uh, the great Clippy disaster in Microsoft, which you could Google. So, uh, so he had trouble differentiating a machine and a person. And but, but Catherine has none of those problems. She's I want to defend him a little. Yeah. <laughs> I, never, all right, never mind. I, you know, maybe I'm channeling Ian. <laughs> so um, uh, the. Um, uh, Catherine uh, really has this uh, very uh, uh, much more uh, open spirit and really reliable emotional <laughs> reactions to these games. But she has this other methodology for describing it. But again, her effort in describing it is to say, how do you make a better one? Then your bonus too. Oh, my bonus too. Yeah, so this is ones I started out with before, uh, but then I thought I was being too cranky and not giving you books, because you asked for books. But, but these were the two things I assigned last year in my narrative class, last semester. Uh, and I thought that uh, um, uh, 
Jamin, um, what's his last name? Warren. Jamin Warren's. People familiar with Jamin Warren's uh, wonderful video cast? That's very, you picked a, a distorting picture of him. He's so, <laughs> he's so cute. And, <laughs> and, um, uh, and then Meg, Jay, Jay Ant, uh, who did um, the 80 Days game. Um, so they're two very different uh, artifacts, but they're both on video. They're not books, they're not all scholarly articles, but they both exist because of a conversation that's been convened by game studies as a discipline of people giving papers and also as something that gets taught in universities. So Jamin does this brilliant uh, uh, anthology of different strategies for using doors. And I, that's, it fits very well with the space assignment that I give to my students. Uh, and then it, there they all are, uh, and uh, you don't have to play all those games <laughs> in order to see them. So that, that a critical discourse about an, an art form that is so at ease with giving you distinctions and showing you, and then using video, which if film studies had had this kind of video at the beginning, it would have saved a lot of uh, bullshit, I think. <laughs> so, uh, so I thought that was really great. And then as an example of how the discourse has become more, more sophisticated. And then Meg uh, describes the moral physics behind um, the 80 days game and she's taking a academic theory of uh, post-colonialism and she's describing how you're, you're frustrated as the white male character because the people that, she, unlike in the naive um, uh, colonialist original and the movies made on it, the people that you run into are not just exotic uh, objects, but they're subjects with their own interests and they don't give a shit about you. So they don't answer you. So that talk is so much more interesting than the game in some way. And it's so, and it makes the game so much more interesting. It was actually Clara uh, uh, who, uh, 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 who recommended this talk to me. Our and fact checker in the uh, wings over here. There you are. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you. Uh, so, um, and then it, so it, it allows you to, to focus a question. Like how, you know, does it work? Does it succeed in the game that she uses this moral physics? If not, how would you make the next one so that it really, you know, that point was clearer? Or, or how would you change that? So I think that, uh, that there's just this very specific critical discourse that is very available. Uh, and it's, it is a secondary effect of this uh, academic discourse, which you don't have to actually read in order to benefit from it. So I think it's one, I mean, these two kind of point to the fact that game studies is creeping its way out of the ivory tower. Yeah, it's training a generation that takes it for granted. And then the indie practice, see the fact that there is a game like 80 Days and that people play it and talk about it and care about why it was made the way it was. It's a very serious game. It's, that's because there's a community that's going to uh, host indie game design. Yeah. Which we, many of you were probably in the crowd the day she gave that talk, I assume, since it was here at practice this past year. Um, instead of... Was that here? That yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, right, right ah, here. Exciting. We are on the hallowed ground of that talk. Oh, that's weird. Oh, um, exciting. Instead of sticking to my um, neutral moderator role, I decided I would Good. talk about a couple of things I particularly like. Um, Brenda Laurel's Computers as Theater was the book that got me thinking seriously about games. This, and coinciding with uh, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman's Rules of Play, those, I think I was reading them around the same time, That's and great. I'd, weirdly, I'd been making games for five or six years at that point, but never thought about them beyond another form of interactivity until I read Computers as Theater. 
and her models of taking sort of Freitag's triangle and Aristotelian plot structure and all of that just kind of opened up doors in my mind for me. So I am grateful to Brenda. I also bring her up because she's one of those folks who unfortunately gets a little bit erased from our history, I feel like. Yeah. It's happening very much right now around VR. She was a very yeah. important early person who you never hear about. Well, but she has an article on Medium, which I assign, which, which I think is going to be the basis of a lot of courses in VR. I think, it'll, I think she'll be back in the curriculum. Good. <laughs> and then the other book, uh, Irving Goffman's Encounters, I think usually when he's talked about in game studies, it's around his concept of frames. But for me, I, I just recently, sometime in the last year, found this book and was shocked that no one had ever told me about it before. He has this amazing essay in there called Fun in Games, where he's yeah. looking at a variety of like, card games and trying to parse out what's special and unique about these things. And he has all sorts of really fascinating insights in there that I've, many of them percolate on somebody else found the same territory you know, 40 years later, but he was there first. But it was back in that period where what we would now think of a game studies work was kind of released out into the atmosphere and there was no community there to kind of grab a hold of it and to attach it to uh, a larger field. And so it got kind of pushed away. And then one other, the uh, Art of Computer Game Design by Chris Crawford. I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One, it's uncanny how many things he sorted out so early. Well, this book came out in 81, yeah. something like that. You can find the full PDF of it up online. And much of the way you all are taught, those of you who are students who have come through game programs, if you were to read this book, much of it would resonate with you, I think, with the way you are taught games, in particular video games. Which means to me that, you know, he was a quite um, wise fellow when it came to analyzing this medium and what it was about, but it always makes me think, makes me a little uh, suspicious. Why haven't we gotten that much further past the way he talks about games? It's a very systems-driven approach. It's a very much about player choice. It's very much about the innate qualities of the computer as a medium. He, w he got all, he was there with all of this stuff. <laughs> And we're still there. And that just makes me a little bit suspicious. So I'll leave it. I don't know if either of you have anything to add to that. I, I mean, I think the wonderful thing about Chris is that he, it's like uh, he's the player rights guy. Yeah. So like he gets really angry when you violate the rights of the player. And he, he articulated that re very well. I, I, yeah. So I think he's very important for that. And then he ran out of the game industry chasing a dragon or something. No, some he's still trying to make he, he's stories system. He's like um, Ted Nelson of, uh, of narrative games. It's true. Um, he's got his own system. I'm, you know. So, how much time do we have? I have one more question for the two of you, and then we'll take some questions from these folks. Um, are there things we have focused too much on over the last 20 years? And are there things we have not paid attention to we ought to have? Well, uh, I mean, I think it's great that we, when we, that we have a discourse for talking about moral uh, values. That I think Mary is very responsible for that. And I think that, that uh, the to, that there's a lot that can be built on top of, of that kind of discourse. Um, and I think that that is a good corrective to what we have too much of, which is um, the, the literary theory uh, discourse of paralysis, where you're, uh, there's uh, a, uh, there is, uh, ideology sort of overwhelms the description of uh, concrete examples. 
uh, and where nothing is good enough, you know, and where the moral is always that it is not uh, uh, politically uh, correct enough, rather than a discourse that says, well, how do, what are, what are the ways to make things better? I guess um, uh, that's what I would say. And I, and I think that the way to do that is to have more genre discourse, more formalism, which is, um, uh, uh, there's just a lot of work to be done around that. And people don't value the making enough, the craftsmanship enough to have enough of a serious discourse around uh, strategies of making. When you say genre, do you mean game genre or you yeah. mean, uh, academic? No, I mean game yeah. genre. I mean game genre and how that in how that intersects with narrative genres or other kinds of, of uh, application genres. But um, I think that games are a very open category, that there's almost nothing you build out of bits that could not uh, morph into a game in some way. Except maybe the Microsoft paperclip you were... <laughs> he haunts you. Yes. <laughs> Clippy. Um, I think that one thing I would love to see happen is a connection not only to these historical precedents and a kind of owning the fact that different technologies change through time and they always have and metal and wood were technologies and so we, you know, in, in a way and so we, 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 we've always found materials through which to create games and we always will so so how that how looking back can actually help us look forward especially when we're now going off screens i mean mm -hmm. our, our you know ar uh, uh, has really yeah. moved us into a place where we're we're doing performance right and we're doing em embodied uh, phenomenological experience out in the world and that 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 is not necessarily what some of this literature has prepared us to think about so um, I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in the way in which we um, think about art. You know, the, there's an art world and there's a game world, and sometimes, sometimes there are little tiny crossings between those two places. You're one of the people who are making these crossings in books, and yeah. I, 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 I think that artists have a lot. Artists, artists play with things. They play. They make games. Artists have always done that as well. Game folks don't always mix in the art circles and go to art shows and get inspired by the art, you know, the art context and, um, you know, performance, theater, immersion, you know, uh, like that kind of stuff informs so much of design. Um, that interests me quite a bit. And of course, the values, you know, taking responsibility for what we do and trying to still make the best possible awesome thing we can. Cool. Uh, I'm sure there's excellent questions that I have failed to ask that you all have for these two folks. So let's open it up for questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, I believe you're a Western film and TV enthusiast. I would appreciate your opinion of the TV game Westworld. Oh. The question uh, was asking Janet's opinion about Westworld. Uh, so I first I didn't watch it because it was too sexist. I, so uh, so I thought, oh, this is made for me, robots and and cowboys, you know. Uh, but then it was so depressingly sexist. I didn't watch it. But then I watched the ending where the women, excuse me, spoilers, kill everybody, and I thought, oh, I could watch this. <laughs> uh, but I thought that it was pretentious. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, all of it. Uh, yeah, I thought, I thought that all of that stuff, uh, I thought that there was a part of it that was trying to engage one of the singular things we have to come to terms with in the 21st century and going forward is, if uh, if machines can think, then who? How are we different from machines? And uh, and I think that that it, so I it's good that that those questions are are coming into popular culture. I didn't. I wasn't excited by it. I thought it had very high production values, <laughs> which often is mistaken for you know art. 
but, yeah. for narrative. Then the acting's fabulous, but often in these these series, the acting, you know, saves the script. Um, but if you look at chapter nine of Hamlet on the Holodeck, I predicted <laughs> a lot of what uh, uh, the um, this long form TV uh, golden age, uh, and I think that. Um, that it's another interesting example of one of these narratives that you could decenter and follow any of the characters. What I expect to happen in the future um, is that people will start to follow just threads through such, so that you only watch the parts of the characters that engage you. Um. Here, then. So. One of the things about game studies as a field that is kind of odd, we're, we're, we're a weird field because we're interdisciplinary, we all come from other places and there's a few of us who have PhDs in game studies. But what is weird is that we have people who come from a humanities background, for example, of sociology, uh, and they study the product like you study literary works or you study you know groups of people, but there's others uh, who also become uh, producers. I mean, the, we have an example here, right? That we study games, but we also make games and we learn by doing. And I think that that's one of the things that makes game studies hard to classify. Yeah. yeah. Because we're in between, and there are departments that might be more open to, uh, to that, but there's others who don't, don't understand that you can also learn by doing. So what do you hear a bit more about what you think about this theorist practitioner, you know, learning through making, which is not new. I mean, Einstein was a yeah. theorist of film and was also a maker. And why this division? Like, what what do we do with this? Like, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think that division between theory and practice actually came about in academic squabbles mm -hmm. and inside universities, and not actually because people really don't care about one or the other. <laughs> um, so this, I, I think, at least in film studies, you know, film studies didn't know when, when it emerged in academia, no one knew where to put it. You know, in, in the days when you were a Sir, a Sergei Eisenstein, you're just writing stuff, and it's cool, and you're making stuff, and that's cool, and like, ah, oh, my brain's gonna explode, yay, you know? It was like that kind of mix of, yeah. of stuff. It wasn't, no one was like, well, you've published a paper, so therefore you're a theorist, it, you know? Uh, name of uh, you, you know, all of all artists were writing. You know, they're all uh, writers. Artists write. You know, they they as a part of their practice, even if it's notes to themselves. And sketchbooks are a form of you know hybrid form between those two things. So, so I I, I think that 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 division is kind of weirdly artificial, and I think it came about because um, because of these academic departments where resources are needed for production but not necessarily needed for theory. I've I've when I was in film school, uh, you know, the, we were in with theory. And practice was in the same department, but you had different people doing different things, and some of us crossed, some of us didn't, some of us were required to cross, you know, like it was always these weird kind of things. And that's still the case in film schools today. Like some are have a requirement of theory, some have a requirement of practice. Like it's the same battle, and and I, you know, and it's also true not to get into academia land, but because I really don't like to go there. But it, it is interesting to see, like, when some professors in theory-heavy departments who are makers go up for tenure or something, they don't, the, their work isn't recognized. Yes. In the same. So that happens, uh, uh, and and it can be the other way around, although less likely. Um, I think that's just kind of, you know, institutional crud that doesn't really, you know, if you can avoid it, then that's good. And just try to, I, I think that theory practice is the most productive place for me because I like, and, and you, and you know, you, <laughs> you. Yeah. And we all, actually, we all make things. Uh, yeah. And Ian too. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over there. Right, so I think that's an important uh, yeah. that's an important thing to notice. Like maybe you know, looking at who uh, and and also Jesper. Yeah. So if you if you think about who are the people writing the stuff that you like the most, they probably are also making stuff. And this is true in film theory too. Like Laura Mulvey and Peter Wallen made films. You know, it's not yes yes. So this is if you dig around, you will find that the people who are very well known in like studies circles often as not have um, produced work as well. Okay, me? Yeah. Well, I've got a question for Ian first. Okay. Yeah, we'll answer it. 
Okay, yeah. No, I want to know, why do you think it took so long for game studies to take off? Why do you think it took computers, some kind of technology revolution, whatever you want to call that, if games have been around for so long and people have been playing with them, mathematicians for... So I'll summarize well, the question. But, but, I mean, uh, but, uh, the question was, why did it take computers for game studies to take off, for us to become interested in the uh, in games. But uh, it's actually not true. People were interested in the 1950s, starting with Wiesinger, and then uh, Brian Sutton Smith, um, who was at the first DIGRA by phone to <laughs> Eric, uh, was at the end of his career, he was retired in Florida. He had done a whole career in play and, um, and uh, games. So, um, and there was Bernie and Coven out there right, too. Right, right, right. And, and the cooperative yeah. games movement that, uh, you know, hippie 60s parents like us used but, to But read. I will jump in and say that a sh a, another short answer to that is that games have been kind of seen as a pastime, as trivial, and as, a, you know, an object not necessarily super worthy of study. For example, Irving Finkel at the British Museum, who is like the game historian guru, if you ever need one, um, watches YouTube videos, it's just awesome. <laughs> um, he, he's actually a, like a Sumerian scholar and a Syrianist at the British Museum. His day job is cuneiform tablets, you know, and then he just happens to know every Thing possible about ancient games because he, he just digs it. And when he was nine, like made a copy of the Royal Game of Ur. And then and in the last seven years found the, the yeah. cuneiform tablet to actually get the correct rules. You know, like this is his life's mission. So there are some people, but they're outliers and it's been a kind of marginalized thing. And I think it also has to do a lot with studies of domesticity, studies of childhood, like that kind of stuff is also relatively recent. Yeah. Ben? <laughs> Like, yes. But I feel like divination isn't in current game studies. I just want to know if you want to think about that. Maybe is it coming back? How do we use divination in computers? <laughs> That's what I'm I'll try to summarize that for people who couldn't hear. Um, the earliest uh, extant objects out there for games are were tools of divination. And Ben was pondering why is that is divination not more of um, a focus? I think we, it is a focus. We just call it big data. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think people do have a naive sense that they're going to get truth from some algorithm. It's exactly the same superstitious faith. I've heard data science called the new phrenology. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but I think divination is better. I think you're onto something. I mean, my sense, my my somewhat cynical take on it is that games often feel like they have enough of a reputation problem with an out <laughs> wow. without muddying themselves with religious with things that people might perceive to be religious and superstitious and otherwise unprovable. That's my own personal cynical pet theory about why divination doesn't get so much focus? <laughs> I'm actually a, a Getty Museum scholar right now. Right, it's this very second, I'm living a dual <laughs> life. While I'm sitting here. While I'm sitting here. Um, and I'm in the archives doing exactly <laughs> this. I, I, I didn't really go there trying to be the witchy woo person to do divination <laughs> stuff. Like, I, you know, it's not what I wanted to do, but I got sucked in because of uh -huh. these tarot cards and whatever. And um, and there, there are some really interesting artifacts like, um, you know, the early early Indian board games actually emerging out of a contemplative practice and and, um, and, and, and some Chinese games that also seem to do that as well. I, I do think it's about this legitimization question and also many of the artifacts really weren't collected globally until recently. People had these pockets of collections. You know, a lot of this stuff was just like, oh, I have this cool thing in my trunk. You know, so the systemic, there's no catalog of historic board games, you know, across all the... Other fields in art history have had much more structure, and you can find catalogs and provenance and sales of things. And you know, there's a there's a whole record system that we just don't really have. It's like, oh, where where's that kind of game? Oh gosh, I better try to look at. So so it, it's just emerging in in um, like uh, people. 
like there's a thesis going on right now in Denmark about um, Indian, the history of Indian board games, and so. Uh, hmm. That is not the history of Indian board games. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's, it's also the die, early dice we use for divination too. So games and divination definitely are are together. I mean, I think Culture. going back to what Mary was just saying about art history and its cataloging. Interestingly, a lot of that stuff started with sort of people of leisure who happened to have time and took up interest and started going around Italy and other parts of Europe and basically making inventories not so different than the way the sort of internet and fan culture that tends to do this. I'm working on a possible exhibition looking at, a, kind of telling the story of Americana through 19 f board games from the 50s through like the 80s right now. And there's this guy who um, made a ton of money off an animated TV series and now one of his passions is collecting everything from that period and the dude's got a crazy, crazy collection. But it's sitting in his uh, bathhouse at his swimming pool sitting there on shelves. He's doing a pretty good job of maintaining it, but it's not probably where it ought to be. Yeah, and there's one there's one person who had a show at the Growlier Club who has 400 historic Game game of the Goose games. Like one, one person. This is not even in a public collection. So, you know, you can get the catalog, though, which I have, and it is awesome. I don't know if this, this sound is trying to tell us to stop. Can we take... Couple more questions. Can you can you take it? This is a test. One more. Oh, oh, they're trying to make the sound stop. <laughs> we think it's Ian. He's very angry at us. <laughs> Aaron. Uh, how are the techniques of the game studies are done? Uh, how is that going to change? So how are the methodologies of game studies going to change, if at all, moving forward? Why are you looking at me? I'm looking at both of you all. Mary just happens <laughs> to be looking at away. you. Yeah. So I, I think that when it began, people um, uh, looked askance at one another's methodologies and that uh, there was a sense of a lack of um, discipline in the discipline. And I think that the, as there's a growing community of practice, it, I think it's, they're drawing on the same methodologies, but they're, they're becoming more um, uh, refined so that there's more, so that after uh, Mary and Celia and T.L. Taylor and, you know, after there's a, a, a body of work that explores different kinds of approaches, uh, then people can build on those approaches going forward. And, and yes, Bert, too, who I was making fun of. Are you playing wear to. suits? Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's a, the, the, uh, that there's each, each of these methodologies I think is getting refined and is making so you get a uh, species uh, speciation that uh, and but with uh, people living uh, in a community and listening to each other's papers so I think I would just add to that like the sense of big data is gonna be you know, like there's waves just like any other you know, just like we're actually as makers, we have to like dump all the data here and there, so we're going to have this kind of stuff. I think also just the rigor is going up, which is great because people are actually learning that you know to run a serious study that social scientists would really believe when you actually say a, d a game does X, Y, or Z. Like th that that rigor is going up, and and that's really good for the whole field because then then there's this kind of trust built across those, those disciplines where people can try to listen to each other and be on this. They're not on the same, they're not on the same using the same language, but they're using um, a high, the same amount of rigor. Right. There's a question way right. toward the back, yes, with the hat, who is now standing. Like you're talking about, I, I thought that I was coming here for something about methodology and, like, 
And it seems like you're talking more about like technique, artistry, as a as a self-expression, and versus like what humans do, the study of what humans are engaging in when they are in games or play, which is different because I read a I read a book. I'll, I'll keep it short. I read a there was a collection of uh, psychological studies called Gaming and Culture, and over and over again they're talking about when when human beings engage a game. They, they are engaging in the act of pro-social community building. And you know, there are rules if you want to be in this particular server and you can kick it out. And yeah. that, that's more of like a like an anthropological idea versus like the technique of the of you know is it playable, is it a sandbox, is it a is it a platform or something like that. I mean there's a TL Taylor's playing Playing in Worlds, what's, I can't remember the playing, between. but playing between worlds, sorry, yeah. And then way before that, Gary Allen finds yeah. uh, fantasy and role playing games, which is a, an amazing book that doesn't get talked about that often, yeah. but. See, I didn't invent game studies. That's my takeaway from this conversation, is that there was a lot going on in well, 1997. I, that was, like, I think, 78 or something like that when that book came out. I can't yeah. remember. Exactly, but there, there was a lot in the 50s or the 70s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what Goffman and a lot of those folks were looking at. But, I mean, I think that it is a valid point that it does seem like we're often focusing on the object and less on the culture around the object. I think that's one of the things Mary's book Critical Play was trying to tease out, right? What we we don't necessarily have the accounts of the players from these times, or if we do, they tend to be the the rich white dude's opinion about it, and that's sort of all that's left. But we do have these objects, right? And trying to stitch together what were the experiences, what was the role in people's lives. Um, that's certainly something, and some of the work I'm doing right now, I'm trying to focus on as well. Um, so, so, so defining the scope of game studies, and what's in it, what's yeah, it, it's all those things. It's everything that you described and more. So, an, an HCI uh, study is a game is part of game studies, and a sociological study is part of game studies, and a, a study on creativity in games is part, and children is part of game study. It's. Okay. It's a well, very and like, big and just test. it's the same as film studies. You know, you have Eisenstein's theory about montage editing as a kind of practice, theoretical practice, and um, and then you have um, you know genre studies and um, even audience audience studies in the 1960s, and television studies looking at how audiences perceived different things on television. And, you know, the, the same kind of mixing of methodologies happen. But you know what I think is the future that we're now going to have is more auteur studies because. Um, I, we haven't had that. Games have been the folk creations without authorship, but digital games have uh, creators, either teams or uh, individuals like film. And so I think we're going to see more and more studies uh, of particular inventors, particular creatives. That's happening in board games, actually. There's a new book coming out on board game ah. inventors. Ah. I have maybe more of an observation. I'm geeking out because of this topic. You're talking about addiction by design. We're talking about divination. And out the, <laughs> and out the window is this billboard about the lotto. Oh. It says, oh. making more New Yorkers rich than any other game. Eva. It's true. But the, but the lotto is this wow. incredibly huge wow. social game. Wow. Yeah. So I'm just having this moment here that is is kind of cool. I'm trying to take a picture of wow. you guys with that billboard out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because it's and you know Brian Sutton Smith thought gambling was okay. I, as he thought that uh, that's one of his categories, and he and it goes with divination. He uh, that shocked me that he was buying lottery tickets in Florida in his uh, retirement, and he said that it's about chance and that we're all aware that our lives are not in our control. And this is a way in which we sort of pay respect to well, that. Was a big data. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> totally. 
Totally. And what's in, I was at the I was at the um, Cooper Hewitt today, and there was you know they're doing Design for America kind yeah. of stuff in there, and there's a there was a whole thing, a whole wall of lottery data of New York City. It's a great visualization if you haven't seen this map. It's got Manhattan and Brooklyn, and you can go and it's got red hotspot target shapes for how many for for the place in which people are buying lottery tickets, like you know the 7-Eleven on the corner of Seventh Avenue. You know, it has it like a specific name of the place, and then how much people have spent into the lottery system and how much has been won out of that place, right? So you can kind of target and look, and there, there are some, some bodegas that have like, you know, people spend $15,000, $20,000 a month in that store and Don't do the, it. the return might be fifteen, you know, fifteen thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars. Oh my God, it's Ian Bogos. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ian oh Bogos. Any last questions for Ian Bogos? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Was was it him, Frank, up there with the jackhammer? Yeah, that was him with the drill. Yeah. <laughs> You've been waiting very patiently. It's divination. It was a kind of divination that just happened right there. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Quick. Question. Quick. Take your seat. Did you save me a stool? Yeah. yeah. It's way over there. We we ostracized you. <laughs> Uh, we were talking before about how uh, gambling games and pop machines in general that lend themselves to like a sense of flow. Do you think all games lend themselves to flow, or only very specific types of games? Do all games have flow? Not, no, I don't think uh, that all games necessarily have flow. I think that it's a, I think it's a sentimentalized virtue, and that's why I thought that the uh, addiction by design sense of the evilness of the zone. Is a um, is a good corrective to it, but I think that it is a. Uh, I think, and I don't think it's peculiar to mechanized games. My father used to play solitaire in exactly that same state of mind. I would say, yes, uh, or it looked that way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that it is a possibility of the game experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ian, you've uh, traveled a long oh, way to join us today. I think the uh, appropriate way to round this out, if you would indulge us, is to let you say a few things. Having no idea. You guys are very bad tweeters. I was trying to keep up <laughs> on my miserable plane and, uh, and having and no idea nothing. what we talked about. Yeah, what did you talk about? Somebody give me something. Why don't you show us slides? No. I don't want to see slides. Yeah, yeah, really fast, really we'll talk about Go that. Go back to his slides. Yeah. Those, that. Okay. That, okay. That was where you were going to talk. All right. We talked about that. What did you say about that? These? No, no, the previous one. The, that? Yeah. We mostly discussed whether or not Jesper was, in fact, the first PhD in game studies, mm. primarily. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. That's where your definition would have gone. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Could you define game studies? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I could do that. I mean, if, you, if this all feels very weird now, yes. right? <laughs> well, we're okay. We're rolling with we it. Wanna, we're yeah. I, I think these folks, we, we, all of us, I think collectively, we can agree we're excited that you are here with us. And yeah, you, you realize so I, I was in an airplane and a, and a and a taxi, so I would have much rather been here. I, yeah. It turns out that uh, you're you're um, you had wind. There was wind. This was the. I, I want everyone to understand that I, I meant to be here, but there was wind. <laughs> and New York City couldn't handle wind. Okay, yeah, I can give you a definition of game studies, I guess. Yeah. I wrote down a bunch. I have this notebook with ideas to just to pr show you that I prepped for this. Um, yeah, I wrote down a bunch of ideas. I don't want to read them all now. Um, maybe I'll try to pick the best. One was the, the, what I called the, the brutally realist definition uh, of game studies, which is the last failed attempt at field building in the humanities. Oh, God. <laughs> I think that That's one idea. Um, there's the, I don't know, sort of the, uh, the alt-political alt economic definition of game studies, which is uh, an epiphenomenon of the accidental uh, meeting of late 20th century North American cultural studies and uh, the Nordic social welfare state. So that was another is another idea. Um, <laughs> the cynical definition, which I know is what you're expecting from me, even though I'm really not a cynic, <laughs> which is a, a temporary jobs program for people who play too many computer games. <laughs> 
I figured you guys would come up with like more, you know, legitimate definitions, and I could uh, I could get away with these, but yeah. then I missed the whole program. So, well, so why is it a failed attempt? Oh, because there are no more fields in the humanities. That 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 process ended oh, probably in the 1970s. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then we 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 didn't realize it until much later. And and you know the, the conditions when game studies. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, are you saying that like English doesn't exist? As no, no, no. English very much exists, yeah, but, but there are no, no new, new ones. Oh, so yeah. it's an attempt to to yeah that that, that ended right right yeah a so goose was it's cooked. It's a colonial. Uh, I don't know if it's colonial or anything. I mean, that seems like it's an expansionist desire on the part of humanity. Oh, I mean, if it were an expansionist desire, that would be great. I mean, that that's sort of like a it's like we we could conquer the new world if we had ships, but we don't. No, it's more like, you know, what happened between the late 1990s and 10 years hence, right? Between 1997, which is, I guess is your date, thus the 20 years, right? And, and 2007 was this, this, this false period of, of the, this kind of coda of the, of the 20th century. Um, and, the, you know, the end of cultural studies and, and all of this. And then we had the, the economic collapse of 2008. And so, you know, and all of that was coming. It's just that no one noticed it for many years. And, and game studies sort of snuck in, snuck in the door thinking, this is going to be awesome. We're going we're gonna to totally do this. It'd be like film studies or something. Uh, but nope. Turns out, nope. It wasn't, it wasn't like uh, that. Uh, so uh, judged by how many... Judged by what? I wasn't, I wasn't asked to provide evidence. Oh. I was just, <laughs> just asked to come to NYU and, and entertain you, right? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, but I, I, can't, I can't give you evidence, though. Yeah, well, right. I judge by the fact that, um, you know, if you, if you just look at the sheer, the sheer volume, the growth, the, the number of people, the, the amount of, of, of work produced, it's, it's quite modest. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's fine, it's nice. I like hanging out with games people. Uh, but that idea that there was going to be this growth akin to even something like film studies, let alone something like literary studies or, you know, or the, the, the so role of, uh, of, of kind of cultural studies more broadly, um, you know, that didn't happen. There's and we've all been kind of people. pretending like that's not, that's not the case, you know? We go to these conferences with 200 people and, and you know, everyone's like, this is awesome, we're doing game studies. No, it's not true. <laughs> yeah. We're just peanut gallering over here. Yeah. We're doing, yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah. I think I think it's fake news. Uh, <laughs> These are my facts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, I just don't uh, know. So you, you I do have a straight definition. You want the straight definition? Yes. No, please. no, no. Uh, I, if yeah. you think, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this isn't this isn't rocket science, people, right? It's like you know, it's just it's just media studies with video games. It's that's it. I mean. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, a lot of you came out to hear that. It seems, <laughs> seems like a disappointment. But that's, we've, that's, we've been waiting for yeah. that, Ian. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things I wanted to talk about, Please. but I didn't get to because I was on an airplane, um, was this, I don't know what you already, what did you, what, is it, this is Mary's definition? Yeah. I guess I should, I should get up to speed. I should read the literature. Yeah, read, read uh, there, there's one sentence. There's okay, another sentence. Okay, there's another one. And that was, and then And then did you do the thing with the, with the, like, the influential? Yeah. What, okay. Yeah, yeah, that was these. And those two. That. All right. That was you. I mean, no, I think I think Jesper's book is right because because Jesper was the the, the f after the, the so-called advent of game studies in 1997, which is an idea that John Sharp invented. Uh, but after that, I take it for granted because it's convincing. After this, uh, after that moment, um, Jesper's book was the was the first um, important one to really to embrace the idea of game studies. Say, I'm doing game studies and to try to do this sort of synthetic thing with, uh, you know, with, um, uh, 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 well, fiction and reality, with, 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 uh, with so-called formalism and, and narrative. And, and, you know, he came up with, like, a really interesting theory that it was kind of a bridge-building theory, and it was, like, deliberately attempting to do field-building work, but also to provide this analytical framework. It was also a book that wasn't about design. I have all these rules that I, I identified for myself about, like, finding important works. Uh, and one of them was, he says, game studies. It shouldn't be primarily about design, which isn't to say there's anything wrong with talking about design, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but the I said that was the touchstone. By yeah, the way. I think this is right. The, the, but the other thing No, that the happened, opposite. I said exactly the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah, no, Janet's wrong, but it's okay because, <laughs> because we, we, if we're going to have a thing called game studies, and then, there are, then there's, there's, we don't talk about like game design studies. We just talk about game design. You know, like you're going to, like the field of game design is its own field. And it's related to, and uh, I don't know, uh, next door to, maybe even in the same room as, 
uh, game studies in a productive way that's not necessarily the case with other fields. I don't have anything against game design or anything. I just think it's useful for our purposes. But anyway, the point I was going to make was that th after this happened, um, moments later, moments later in historical time, um, essentially game studies became qualitative social science. I think that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. Like calm and sociology sort of took over and has essentially remained in charge uh, since. Since like, you know, let's say 2006, 2007. And you, first you had the kind of multiplayer game version of that and you had the, you know, the kind of our, our virtual worlds, real worlds and what's the relationship between them. And then you, ha and then you kind of fast forward into uh, what we see the majority of work we see is about players and kind of so-called player studies and um, you know what people do with games. Uh, even game criticism is is fairly, which is what we'd expect from a humanities discipline. I mean, fairly, just not, not very common. Uh, so th those were some of the comments I was going to make if I'd had time to do them properly. I mean, you didn't have to wait for me for an hour. How long was it? Yeah, God, that, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, folks. Um, all right, well, that's a quick summary of what I was going to say, if I had had the context to actually talk about it. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Don't misinterpret my monotone, please. Um, all right, I think we need to bring things to a close now. I just got here, John. I just, I, I just got here. Can I take one question? Come on, one question. Well, give, me, uh, give me, throw me a bone. All right. Somebody must have a question for Ian. All right, yes, okay. sir. I mean, the humanities, like... Yeah, 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 I'm not saying the humanities are over, but that the idea of making new fields within, within the, the sort of meta-discipline of the humanities uh, is over, has ended, and probably ended just before we started trying to make one in game studies, but we didn't notice. But yeah, the, the humanities are thriving in certain ways and not in others, and certainly they are engaging with games and computing and social media and all the rest of it in, in good and in bad ways. Um, and in fact, that, that, there's that, been that sort of diaspora of, of games into other fields that's also happened. I mean, people are just trying to get by, right? They're just trying to do their thing. You know, they, they I mean, literally the, the, the way that, the, what happened to the academy after 2008 can't be underestimated. I think about this a lot. Like, what would have happened to this field had uh, the economic collapse not taken place? Uh, if you wanted to write that alternate, you know, universe fiction of, of game studies, I mean, be, <laughs> there's not that many readers for that, but it'd be interesting to read. I would like to read it. Um, I think you would see a whole different present. So what would that be? What would be your fantasy? Of well, I don't have a fantasy, really. I'm just curious about... What would be know, a game studies you would approve of? <laughs> <laughs> now I've got you, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any inclination to approve of anything. Well, what, really. if I let you, yeah. what if I let you then dispute it? You can, then you could dispute yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a lovely dream to imagine that you could have this sort of, sort of thriving global community of tens of thousands of people studying games. Uh, but, I mean, it just seems like it was an unrealistic one from the, from, from the get-go, right? Now, to say that, that maybe, maybe that was a dream from another era, right? That it was the wrong dream to have, and that what we ended up doing was the right thing to do, but we haven't, just, we haven't said that out loud. I think we kind of need to say that out loud and then say, okay, what, you know, what, what is the, the, the small niche audience uh, that we are serving uh, with this work? And if you don't think it's a small niche audience, let me tell you, it is. It is very much a small niche audience. Um, and even, even talking about games to a, a so-called general audience in the mass media, uh, it will disabuse you very quickly of, of the idea that there's a that there's a mass there's a mass audience uh, for this for this kind of work. Uh, whereas, for better or worse, you can talk about um, you know Hollywood films that way. For better or worse, I mean, for you know, I really mean it. Um, so I I don't have a fantasy about how things should have gone. I mean, I'm not really I'm not that interested in sort of sort of waxing either nostalgic or sort of futuristic about, um, 
this is what will come of game. Haven't we done enough of that with games? This sort of this sort of event horizon where finally we will come into our own and mature into the the art form we were meant to be. It's kind of bullshit. Like we we have the things we have. We can do what we can with them, and let's do it. That's fine. That's enough. That seems like an excellent place to stop. <laughs> so I would like to uh, thank. Frank, Dylan, Gwyna, Jessica, Brendan for helping us pull this thing off tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we must thank Janet, Mary, and Ian and for LaGuardia their Airport. sage words. And uh, yeah, the, the folks at LaGuardia Airport and whoever made wind. And the... Uh, Whoever made wind. Yes. Right. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really appreciative that you all came and took part in this tonight. And, uh, and I want to thank John thank for... Thank Because... Um, Just because. Just because. But I'll... Mine, mine died. Um, I, I want to also give me all of them. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, only because um, tomorrow we're going to be at the College Art Association with a little bit of a different focus talking about uh, this with a bunch of folks, you know, who are engaged in art history and critical art practice. So it's, um, they're, they're not going to be um, necessarily a, a game literate audience. So we'll have a very different conversation. So I think it's really great that John wanted to um, really push to bring that, uh, this discussion here at the Game Center. I think it's really the right place to have us. Um, and I would love to um, get, we get any extra questions after our, our talk here today. So, and thank you, John. You're welcome. All right, thanks for coming, y'all. Have a good night. <laughs>